Special Operation Forces on Saturday rescued an American hostage at the northern Nigerian border. The man was taken hostage by armed men earlier this week in Niger and taken to the border where U.S. forces freed him without suffering any casualties. The governor of the local region where the abduction took place said six men on motorbikes armed with AK-47s came in the man's property in the village of Masalata and after demanding money, the men took the American citizen with them to the Nigerian border. Joining us to speak on this, as well as insecurity in the nation and police reforms, is security expert and former assistant general at the Department of State Services, Dennis Amakari. Good morning. Good morning. Amakari. Thank you for yeah, joining morning, us on see. this program today. Good morning. Well, you know, the U.S. Um, security forces conducted this um, operation and you know, reports indicate that they, you know, partnered with the Nigerian authorities and the Nigerian government to, um, you know, do this uh, operation. Now, when an American citizen is captured, they work with local authorities to rescue their citizens. Now, analysts are asking, why is it that the Nigerian security forces have not partnered with in international intelligence to help fight insurgency or even help rescue the Chibok girls? Olia Sharibu. A very pertinent question. Um, we actually uh, should be worried that uh, when they needed help, they came to us. Um, it was a joint operation by the Nigerian and Nigerian um, uh, security forces with the uh, American Navy SEALs. And uh, of course, they did a lot on their own uh, to locate, because this was a very high, um, high, dangerously uh, high tensioned uh, operation. Um, in fact, usually the rate of success is about 30%, but they pulled it through, and their president was very, very happy. Uh, now, when you look at it, the CIA had to play a very, very important role there, where they helped in uh, supplying uh, real-time intelligence, um, of course, to locate exactly where the hostage is. And then, of course, the SEALs have to move in there and then uh, save the hostage. So uh, these kind of technologies that they are using, which we wanted, sometimes are not made available to us, you know, because um, if we have uh, uh, technologies like that, we should be able to locate where the Chibo girls are or any other hostage, you know, yesterday. And we have to also have a political will in doing this because for the American government, they've mentioned it clear, no single American government uh, citizen will be captured without being released. And they went for it. But uh, we also had um, a pastor. Many people don't know that. There was a plateau pastor that was released yesterday, same time. But nobody heard about it. I did. I, I heard about that. OK, you do. OK. <laughs> and I think uh, ransom must have been paid. Now, the United States government have uh, a zero tolerance to paying ransom. and. Um, we should walk towards path like that if we want a high level of success. Right. Uh, I'll pursue this further, but let's come home to Nigeria and talk about uh, the IGP and his statement. What's your position on the IGP statement to defend themselves, uh, that the police force, I mean, uh, of officers should defend themselves in the face of any attack, especially, especially when they are in danger? I think we are still going about it wrongly, wrongly. Because what we are actually asking for is a reformation of the police force, a total reformation. Now, the police people are worried, should I say, I'm not saying scared, but they are withdrawing from coming out to... Probably scared too, uh, <laughs> worried well, and well, maybe a little bit scared. Want to use that kind of word, but... Uh, <laughs> They are not coming out. And actually, people might attack them. Because right now, all these protests and riots and everything started with 
and SARS. Yeah. Okay, so they feel withdrawn that uh, maybe if they you go through the traffic and you don't even see a single one at all. But this is a golden opportunity for the police to rearrange themselves, mm. to reform themselves, so that by the time we start seeing police outside, we will know that yeah, they are they are there for you know the public good. But if you tell them to go back out, and then if they are going to defend themselves with arms, do we want police with arms? Do we still want police that are carrying AK-47s around? Mm. You know, these are the pertinent questions. Yeah. We want a police that will service the country. And those that are going to carry arms are going to be like, you know, they've suggested SWAT. Mm. SWATs are not seen every day on the streets. And I think that's the way we want to, this new SWAT that they are proposing should be like that. We want them, we don't want them to come and set uh, checkpoints all over the place. They should be in their camp, training constantly. And then of course, when high violence crime occurs, you call them, they come out, do their job and withdraw. And that, that's what the IG, I, I, IG said that much uh, 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 about there not being any longer uh, the patrol thing will stop. IG said that much when he was talking about it. Before my colleague comes in, let me follow you up on this question of police not being on the road. That is absolutely true. Yeah. And they are quite apprehensive. And you cannot, maybe, maybe you cannot blame them. It's like they have been what I would call the phrase is psychologically scared, not uh, scared, A-R-E-D, but scared, R-R-E-D. All right, uh, you're no a security moral. expert. No the no question, moral. yeah, the question is here, here is healing. How do you begin to get them to heal? How do we get to what? Get, get them to heal. Heal, oh, heal. Yeah, okay. How do you get the police to heal? Right now, I think, like I said, this is the golden opportunity for the police to do a lot of things. Number one, let's have dialogue. I expect the IG to start calling for town hall meetings, all the way down to local government areas. Call the town hall meetings, call people to come, call the police to be there. Let people say what they don't like and let the police tell them, you know, how they are going to operate. And of course, it's a people's police that we need. Right. You know, we don't need uh, a police that is going to shove everything down our throat. And of course, this dialogue is very, very important because, you see, we keep on blaming only the police. We should also blame the Nigerians. We should blame the Nigerians because when you are looking for reform, mm -hmm. we have a lot of problem with Nigerians. Right. They don't obey laws. Some of them don't want to stay at a, a, a red light and wait for the light to change. You know, uh, and so you, you, you find out that what are we really striving for? All right, I'll come in here. You know, the, still on the Inspector General's uh, question, I mean, statement on uh, Friday where he talked about the police, you know, has the right to protect themselves. You know, I know it is to obviously boost their morale. He also um, added that, you know, adequate um, compensation will be given to families who have lost their lives. I mean, there are about 22 policemen that have been killed. Now, that statement has rubbed up a lot of people the wrong way. Is it that the police do not know that they have the right to protect themselves? A lot of people are saying now that um, statement is um, sort of a, a way uh, that the IG is telling the police, you know, you now have the license to kill. You know, I mean, what, what was the, I know it is, it is to boost their morale, but how, how can it be looked at in the right way? Do you know that there is a, a, a group of policemen, uh, the riot police, who will later, uh, called the mobile police and uh, later called Mopoles. Mm -hmm. And they are, let me tell you their street name. Their street name is Kill and Go. Right. And if you have that kind of name, that means you can kill and go right. and nothing will happen. Right. See, that is the mentality. 
So when you tell them to protect yourself, they feel that, you know, in fact, there are many things to be changing in the police force. Well, he gave a caveat. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know? He gave a caveat. Uh, yes. So we should add the caveat. The caveat of protecting themselves? Yeah, he gave a caveat. That? He said, except and only when you are in danger. I just wanted to get that. I mean, out. they do know that. That's the point. They do we know that. Define, <laughs> we have to define when you are in danger. All right. Um, do do hold that thought, Mr. Mercury. We'll go on a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue on this conversation. Stay Thank with you. us. Yeah, glad to know you're still there. We we'll still have a security expert, uh, Dennis Mercury. Uh, Continue from where you stopped. I was just trying to add that the uh, police chief added for good measure only when you're in danger. I just thought I should add that. Oh, yeah, when you're in danger. But, you see, we cannot define when you're in danger means because, um, you see, the, the police should not be carrying arms around. I remember when I was in service, you don't carry except for particular level of officers. Not everybody carries guns, but here you see sergeants, uh, corporals, you know, uh, constables, just carrying AK-47 all over the place. They take it to their houses. They are not supposed to do that. They are supposed to keep these arms with the armorer, and when you want to go out for any special operations, then you go and sign for it, and then go out. So. Uh, these are areas that the police have to look at very strongly. All right. Uh, let me add this. You're aware, Dennis, that uh, every nation in the world has its peculiarities. I mean, you talked about the fact that I'll always like to use the word some. It could be some could mean 10 percent. It could be 90 percent disobey the law. You talked about traffic light. Yes, sometimes I stand on traffic light red and somebody's honing behind me to move because apparently there's no car ahead and so I should move. So every nation has its peculiarities. Nigeria is not an exception. I'm sure you'll agree with that. Of course. This question of police officers wearing body cams, why is there no real discussion around it? Can it work here? You know, we are not structured like that to for every policeman to wear his body cam and then of course if you are wearing a body cam remember there are consequences if you turn it off and those are for mainly patrol officers who are stopping cars on the highway our own patrols don't patrol around they are parked somewhere and then uh, of course I don't know if they even respond to distress calls. So these are the kinds of, um, uh, should I say, reforms that we want. How do we want our police? Do we want them to be the same way they are? Or do we want to now put one or two, uh, two policemen in a car patrolling an area, a particular area that is prone to crime? Are we going to arm them? Are we not going to arm them? How about the ones that are on foot? Are we going to, you know, allow them to move around without guns? Because if you say the society, maybe they will, they will rationalize it by saying that the society is very dangerous. So let's that, hold That's guns. what I was talking about, peculiarities. Yeah, peculiar, those peculiarities are there. So considering all these peculiarities, we should sit down and have a town hall. And then, of course, let the people talk. And let the police also talk about their own experience about Nigerian people and then come up with a common ground on which the, uh, the police can operate. Right. There's been this damning mis, um, you know, mistrust between the security operatives and you know, the Nigerian people. Now, you know, the judicial panel for victims of SARS and the Lekki Tollgate incident have started and investigations are on the way. On Friday, they met some constraint when they went to the military um, um, hospital. Yes. They, would, they weren't allowed in. 
Now, a lot of people have you know, expressed frustration with this um, system. And um, you know, they're all saying that the military is still trying to hide information. How can we gain trust with this investigation? Yes, there is that constant trust deficit still exists right. between the law enforcement and security agents with Nigerians. Right. And I think the long rule of military in Nigerian government has really affected us a lot. You will hear the hierarchy of the army will say, we subjugate ourselves to civil authority, to civil authority in democracy, but when they are set up, like a panel was set up to go and investigate, and uh, the military comes around to say, no, we cannot let you in. You know, that's, uh, that's some kind of conflicting. Right. So I, I, think, I think these are areas that we should look at because I think we still, our military don't still feel that we are not in a, demo, we are in a democracy. Because when you look at it, they are involved in everything. They are involved yeah. in most states in the country, the, you know, elections, this and that. Uh, you know, because the police is not uh, well equipped to handle things. But why don't we train the police? Why don't we take them into all those trainings that they should have? Uh, what is the different kinds of weapons that they have that the police cannot be trained? The SWAT is supposed to be special weapons and tactics. So if the SWAT is going to be training, they are going to use weapons that are even more superior than military, you know, military weapons. So why don't we do it? So this, this is the situation that we're looking at. You're raising a very interesting question. And, 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 and let me tackle you on that. A serving officer says that after 35 years in office, police collect... We read this thing yesterday, at, and I was touched. Police collect a monthly pension of 28,000, Dennis, a serving officer made this statement. And then there's also the statement uh, that, and so I'm, I'm trying to ask you, is it true that the military, because you were talking about the military being in everything, everywhere, that the military whittled down uh, police number and its operations to ensure uh, they didn't seize power. I, I don't know whether you have had that. I, I, I read it in the papers yesterday, and I, I was wondering, as, it, as an expert, what's your sense of that statement, of course, the, the fact of the 28,000 naira pension? You mean, uh, is it true that they are earning uh, that kind of money? No, no, not that one. That one is true. But the fact that the military whittled down the power of the police. Yes. And uh, of course, they are, you know, they are, the military is, by numbers, they are smaller than the police. You know, there are more policemen than military men in this country. Military, Navy, Army, uh, Air Force put together. It's about something around 350 or something like that. But the police are almost about 400. So, thousand. A uh, thousand, please. So, why is it that the police cannot handle their own case and they have to call in the military all the time? Or why does the military invite themselves into? Because, you see, the military will always only come into internal security issues when they are invited. Right. But I think there are certain situations where they come, they come in by themselves, or they feel that there are certain uh, duties that uh, is traditional for them to take part in. So we still have this problem. You know, it, it, is, it is something that um, should be looked at from the very top. And then, of course, the areas of responsibilities have to be clearly defined, clearly defined, so that um, um, we enjoy our democracy, so to say. Right. You know, so as a security expert, still on the judicial panel, what should they, what is the critical point that they should be focusing on at this point? What, what would your advice be? 
Well, the judicial panel has been given their... Um, uh, terms of reference. Yeah, terms of reference, and uh, they've gone through it. They are going through it, mm -hmm. and um, if part of uh, that terms of reference is to verify who is... Um, who was hurt or wounded or killed, and uh, who shot and who did he shoot? Because the first um, uh, the first statement from the army was that they were not there. Right. You know, and then of course later they said they were invited. When we started seeing different kinds of cartridges that are military grade cartridges that were found in the uh, scene of incident, so. I think the judicial panel, for this initial initial rejection by the military to allow them access, should go ahead above their head and then talk to um, talk to their bosses. Mm. You know, talk to their bosses because this particular panel, although it's in Lagos State, I think it was the president that uh, yeah. sanctioned it. So mm. they should they should talk to the commander in chief and say. Hey, we're having some hitches and uh, find out what uh, they could do about it. Well, they later allowed them to enter. They did. I just want to know did. in they terms did, really. of, I mean, what, what, would, what would it be that, what, what, should, what would be the first thing that they should focus on? Actually, to even gain public trust, what should they focus on? Well, um, I think they're not doing wrongly. Right. They are doing very well. Um, they, are, they are, you know, looking at every every uh, turning all stones and finding out what is ha what happened mm -hmm. uh, so i think they are doing well i i don't think we have to give them more uh, right. well, terms of reference yeah. to follow all right at this time uh let's look at uh, 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 um, the governors that are supporting the ig Mohammed adamu on police reforms and they're asking PSC, Police Service Commission, the IG himself, and the Nigeria Police Council to, as a matter of urgency, review the remuneration and emoluments of police officers. But some stakeholders are saying that the new 2020 Police Act is not enough to solve problems facing the force. What's your take, Dennis? You have just about a minute and 30 seconds, I guess. Well, um, total reform is the answer. Total reform. If they have to review the salary, which they should, because I think the police had been abandoned for so long. Yeah. Remember, the police had produced so many different kinds of uh, subgroups, sub or should I say other security agencies, like even the DSS, uh, EFCC, you know, but these other ones that came out from the police are better taken care of than the police itself. So if you want to look at the police and, and their remuneration, I think this, this is still the best time. I still believe that this is a golden opportunity for the police to start all the things that they want to do. All right. All right. And that'll be it. Uh, Thank bye. you so much for joining us on this program, Mr. Macquarie.